So mm -hmm. we bring a set of wisdom and lived experiences that connect with the knowledge to make it what it is. So when we enter our institutions, only we have the wisdom we bring to the table and that wisdom mm -hmm. is necessary right now. And anytime we show up in the fullness of our wisdom, there, there is a student, there is a faculty member, there's an alum, somebody who is being moved by that. And just because you mm -hmm. don't hear it doesn't mean it's not happening. So mm -hmm. just don't underestimate the energy that, that you all bring um, to, to our, our, our educational communities. Hello, and welcome to Student Affairs Now. I'm your host, Keith Edwards. Today, we're discussing career transitions in student affairs. Student Affairs Now is the premier podcast and online learning community for thousands of, thousands of us who work in, alongside, or adjacent to the field of higher education and student affairs. We release new episodes every week on Wednesdays. Find details about the episodes or browse our archives at studentaffairsnow.com. Today's episode is a special bonus episode brought to you by Colorado State Online. CSU Online is now offering a fully online Master's of Science in Student Affairs to help you succeed as a higher education administrator. As I mentioned, I'm your host, Keith Edwards. My pronouns are he, him, his, and I'm a speaker, consultant, and coach, and you can find out more about me at keithedwards.com. I'm broadcasting from Minneapolis, Minnesota at the intersections of the ancestral homelands of the Dakota and the Ojibwe peoples. And I'm really glad to have two special guests today. We'll get them to introduce themselves in a moment, but today is a special bonus episode as part of our two-part series on career transitions in student affairs. Be sure to check out our part one of this conversation that focused on early to mid-career transitions with Tony Cawthon, Kristen Wilker Donnelly, and James Adam, Jane Adams Dunford. Today, we're going to focus on the career, other career transitions, a whole slew of them. So we've got these two folks here to kind of clean everything up, all the other transitions. We're joined by one of the editors and a contributing author to the same book, Managing Career Transitions Across the Lifespan for Student Affairs Practitioners. So let's inter introduce yourselves. Let's hear from you. Tell us a bit about you and a little bit about your experience with career transitions. Dina, let's start with you. All right, well, thank you, Keith. My name is Dina Neese. Um, I use she, her pronouns, and I am an associate professor and newly coordinator of our online doctorate in higher education administration program. Um, in terms of career transitions, I have transitioned from being entry-level practitioner to doctoral student, and then from practitioner back to faculty member. And now it seems um, as though too, in some ways, not only in addition to faculty, uh, my career transition has a little bit of an administrative component to it. So those have been my experiences over the past, it's almost 20 years since I've been in, um, started in higher education. Wonderful. Mom, tell us, go ahead and introduce yourself. Thank you, Keith. It's, it's so good to be in community with you and um, to be in community with Dina as well. My name is Mantha Akapati and um, I use she, her pronouns and uh, I am a mom and that's gonna come up in career transitions conversations later on. So I always start with that. Um, and uh, yeah, you know, it's so interesting. I, and, and as I was reflecting on this question, <laughs> I was like, oh, I've not been in the field for a very long time and, <laughs> and then, um, that's not true. Um, and and so reality I, sets in. <laughs> yes, reality sets in. And you're like, oh, okay. So, um, you know, I think, um, you know, we tend to tell our stories linearly, right? And so certainly within uh, career progression, you know, the exploration of a career, you know, going to graduate school and kind of, um, I, I mean, it, it is linear. And so I don't want mm -hmm. to um, diminish the linearity, but what the story that we tell in a linear way, I had, you know, first I was in graduate school and then my career progressed at another level and then another level with increasing responsibility, et cetera, um, was not a linear journey, right? The, the, the reflection is not, re is not linear. Um, and so, um, and I, I still don't know what I wanna do when I grow up. So I feel like I have this title, but it doesn't tell the stories of the negotiations that kind of um, come along the way when we talk about career transition. So. Um, so, you know, certainly I've had a series of increasing responsibility. I've been lucky to um, have had opportunity to be in the classroom um, as well as be an administrator. I find joy in the messiness. Um, and so that's what I'm always looking for. But, you know, again, uh, I'm excited to, to process all of that with you and Dina. 
Mm -hmm. And tell us what is the role that you're currently occupying? Ah, yes. Um, so I am just finishing up actually my first year as vice provost for university life at the University of Pennsylvania. Congratulations. Congratulations. Yes, congratulations. Yeah, thanks. Uh, well, as I mentioned, this is part uh, of a two-part uh, series of episodes on career transitions. Uh, Dina, you're one of three uh, co-editors for this volume, which folks can, can access and we'll include in the show notes. Tell us a little bit about the book and some of the additional career transitions you and the contributing authors explored. Yes, um, for the book, when um, Tony, Kristen, and I started talking, we tend to think of, and this takes me to something Mamta um, talked about earlier, we tend to think of the journey in segments, early professional, mid-career professional, senior student affairs, doctorate, yet we wanted to see all of those transitions across the lifespan. So in this um, second part of the book, we really talked about looked at what would it take um, when people ask you the question, you know, I'm considering a doctorate. What should I do? What should my reasoning be? So considering a terminal degree um, in one's field, and it doesn't need to be in education. Some individuals go into other areas such as business or even legal. Um, so we wanted to provide some context there. Uh, for my uh, journey to like the transition from practitioner to faculty and looking at it doesn't just need to be tenure track faculty. When we talk about the profession as educators, how do we educate um, from where we're at? And that may not need to be a tenure track faculty role. That can be an instructor. We have student affairs professionals serving as adjuncts, as lecturers, and looking at that transition. And one of the chapters to, in addition to retirement, was looking at the complexities of social roles. And I know that was the chapter Amanta contributed to to along with others, because we can't forget, you know, the identities, the social identities and where we're located at as we're approaching these transitions. Because I know even in my, each of my transitions, each was motivated um, by a where I was at the time. Um, and I know even my transition to faculty was not even something I had on my journey. I thought I was gonna be a vice president for student affairs. And then I realized I really like teaching. So how do I continue to do that? So it's looking at those and, and think about how our professional worlds, our social worlds and who we are collide as we or collide or integrate as we go along this journey in the field. And I consider it a journey um, as well. Yeah. Well, and as you're talking about, it's a journey and not always linear in how we think about it. Maybe appears that way on the resume or on LinkedIn, mm -hmm. but maybe not in our experience of that. And I really relate to this. I had a very linear traditional student affairs experience, grad school, job and res life, doctorate, mid-level job. And then I went totally skew and left that and working on my own and working for myself and working with lots of different folks as a consultant and speaker. And so um, that has been a part of it. But then another thing I'm connecting with Dina as you're talking about this is uh, as an executive coach, just about everybody I talk to, um, whether they're in higher ed or not, wants to talk about their career and what goes on with that. And when you really reflect, most people realize that their focus is on the next job, the next role, the step up, the better title, the bigger office, the bigger salary. And what they miss is this sort of holistic thinking of, is that a better life for me? Right? It might double my salary and be this SSAO job that I've always wanted, but is that a better life in terms of location and all of those other things? and bringing in all of those considerations about family, location, identities, um, the, the role, the work. There's, <laughs> I hear people say, I want that title. I don't want to do that job every day, mm -hmm. right? Those are very, yeah. mm -hmm. very different things. So Mamta, you contributed to this wonderful chapter on the complexities of identity and career transitions. Um, what can you offer to those of us wrestling with all of this? Yeah, so I mean, I guess the first thing that I would say is, um, well, first I want to offer gratitude to um, the co-authors of the chapter. There were, um, it was a, a constellation of colleagues. So Claire Robbins, Nicole Johnson, Kendall Pete, um, Gabby Porcaro, and uh, Dina as well, right? So this the constellation of wisdom in that space. I want to really hold and uplift the sacredness of their wisdom. Um, and you know, as I was listening to both of y'all speak. Um, I am somebody who has the fancy title, right? And I, mm -hmm. I want to start with that um, as a, a naming or taking responsibility of, I'm, I'm sitting literally in a privileged identity space. Um, 
with the title and the salary and the, you know, I received those messages. I pursued that opportunity, right? So uh, it's easy for me to say a lot of things right now today about what I may or may not do or what people, you know, things that I'm thinking about. I just want to take a moment to name the privilege and, and the seat that I sit. And saying that, um, I will also fully own that I feel like the career transition, much like any other life transition, I feel like it's a reconciliation of circumstances, right? It, it's a reconciliation of circumstances and opportunities. Um, and some of those things we have choices around and some of those things we don't. And I, I, um, I don't think we speak openly enough about the circumstances piece. Mm -hmm. So I will own, you know, I had probably one of my best, my best career experiences um, at my prior institution um, at Rollins College, which I love and will always hold this uh, special place in my heart, right? Um, and I also know the toll it took on me to be the first and only up to that point person of color at the cabinet level in the history of that institution, right? And so I can't untether having this powerful experience and the continual toll it took um, for the intersections of my identities in that position. And, and, and we get to openly talk about those things and consider um, what are the things that are most meaningful to us or what do we need um, to both take care of ourselves, but also uh, live our purpose in the world. And so for some of us, our positions or our jobs are extensions of our purpose in the world. For some of us, it may not be. And so um, I think uh, I, I would just say whatever, whatever people are feeling or wrestling with, because it could be different, right, is real. Um, and I think we question the validity of what we're feeling and thinking. So I'll stop with that, but um, not, not that you need me to validate things, but that's mm -hmm. what I would offer for now. Well, yeah, thanks, Elizabeth. Dina will bring you in, but what, what I was, and, and, and you said it much better than I will be able to sort of paraphrase, but these, these things are in, I think oftentimes we find ourselves with our values in conflict. I value this, and so that means this, but I also value this and it means something different. And I'm always encouraging folks where you find those values in conflict, how do you get them out of conflict and put them in conversation? How does this value talk about this value and how do you put them in conversation? So they're, they're not, it's not a binary either or thinking, but I value this and I value this. So now what does that mean in a greater complexity? I think you were pointing to that. Yeah, I was gonna say that, that has been the hard, what, I, I don't say hardest, um, but that has been probably the most profound growth opportunity for me along the arc of my own uh, journey is being in, in reconciliatory spaces with those values, right? Um, and, uh, you know, I think no institution is perfect. Most mm -hmm. institutions are founded with complicated histories. Um, we find ourselves sitting at tables, you know, uh, really in this interesting sets of negotiations. And so at the end of the day, how are you going to be fully present in a way that both honors what you're willing to accept and what you're not willing to accept and what you need and what you like, what are your, like, I think for any of us, I, like I always sit and say, what are my non-negotiables, you mm -hmm. know, and, um, and then have clarity around that. But, but that's a privileged thing, right? My non-negotiables, I, maybe I can walk away from things today because I have a very privileged identity, but mm -hmm. 10 years ago, I couldn't. Mm -hmm. Right. And, and I, so I just, I want to, um, say that, you know, I, I can appreciate the, the complexities for people. Yeah. And well, and every institution, every role, every region has its upsides and downsides. Mm -hmm. um, the thing is that the place you're at, you just know all of that. The place mm -hmm. you're going to, you don't always know all of that. Mm -hmm. But, yes. you know, I always tell folks, if, if they've convinced you that they don't have any flaws, you're in real trouble. Uh, <laughs> but if they said, here's all Absolutely. of our mess, Yes. You know, we want to be transparent about it. And you think, well, that's that's unfortunate, but I can handle that. These yes. things I can't. Then I think you're going into it uh, with a little bit more clarity. You know, what would you, you contribute to this chapter and you probably invited this chapter in as one of the editors. What would yes. you want to add to this about, um, you talked about the social context and the social location and our identities as we're thinking about some of these transitions. You know, and as I was contributing, we all uh, crafted our own narratives and talked about our experiences. And I felt a sense of if it's a word, it was like cathartic to actually talk about the feelings behind it. So even in my um, one of the identities that resonated with me is I'm a first generation college student. Um, I'm the first in my family to have a doctorate and to even 
my parents did come to my dissertation defense and they were excited because they were proud. They said, we don't know a lot of the scholarly literature or what you're doing, but we know it's a big deal. Um, so it was nice to feel validated in some ways in that way and also an achievement. So when I um, looked at faculty, I knew like one, it was a it's a privilege to be able to go into that position. And I felt honored in, in ways that I'm like, oh, somebody actually institutions wanted that kind of scholar practitioner piece. But I remember when I was coming specifically to where I'm at now, there were two male faculty. And one of the things that I didn't, I thought about it, but it didn't hit me at the time until like some of the students said, you're the first female faculty we've had in the program. I'm like, oh, so I'm like thinking of that as, okay, maybe I'm a role model. Maybe I'm a possibility model. And others who have said, uh, specifically because our institution at West Georgia, um, our institution is about 30% underrepresented students by race and ethnicity. So other students were asking, you know, can I do this? You know, could I be a faculty one day? And I want to validate that, that of course that they can. So for me, it was reflecting on that in my own journey, but also looking at what my purpose is and, um, and looking at it's to kind of, it's not only being my identity as a female and providing that possibility, but also encouraging students, because a lot of our students are also first generation, that they have the possibility to do this as well and to not discount their lived experiences and their knowledge, because that is knowledge. It is context. They, there is this sense, and when, when they ask me sometimes, you look like you're doing this so well, I said, I'll tell you each time I go up in class, I am nervous because you challenge me and I challenge you. So I am nervous. I, I know I have to, I know I'm looking at different things. So you're pushing me while we're both kind of co-creating this learning space. So in that transition, it was a personal one um, in terms of, you know, wanting to achieve. And I, I mean, I had no idea. I'm like, I, my undergraduate professors thought at one day you could be in the academic world. And I'm like, I just want to, I'm like, I didn't have a context for that. My grandparents, um, my, my grandfather was a coal miner. So that's the context I had. So in terms of contributing that, I think it was something that was validating, yet there's something to all of our institutions. Keith, I loved how you mentioned this, that our institutions are imperfect and we still run into gendered and institutional norms. Um, and there's some of that I've experienced, but yet I've have to realize, okay, how do I negotiate this space in this tension in terms of what, what you mentioned, what's important to me, but also how can I be an advocate for my students? What, where can I advocate from this position that I have now um, is having a doctorate and being a female, how can I advocate and what, where can I advocate um, for students? And that's been something that's been very important to me. Right. I think this really, you're highlighting a tension that I think uh, I see so often which is um, people want to work in these perfect work environments and they want to be needed. <laughs> yeah. Yes. And the perfect work yes. environment doesn't exist and you're needed there. And so I think, uh, which puts back to where do you put these values in conversation where um, this institution maybe is super trans inclusive um, and this institution has a long way to go and you might be more comfortable here but more needed by the students here. And, and what, what, what are you willing to compromise and what are you not willing to compromise? Where do you wanna be of service? Where is the toll on you as a human too much? Um, and I think navigating some of that. Um, Mamta, do you wanna to add to that? Yeah, you know, it was so interesting. As I heard Dina talking, I remember, I remember my first uh, term at Oregon State University. My daughter was a newborn at the time. <laughs> And um, uh, one of the, the CSSA graduate students, she just come to my office and my office was a disaster. I mean, there were pamper boxes on the floor um, because you can carry, those boxes are nice to carry books in. And so you don't overfill them anyway. So there were boxes on the floor. There's a comforter on the ground because I would often bring um, Saya into the, and she would like play on the floor sometimes when I had meetings, like after daycare time, right? And, and I will never forget. She looked and she was like, I think I can be a dean of students now. And I said, that was just like a random state, like, tell me more. And she was like, your office is a mess. And I said, yes, it is. And she was like, you don't have everything together. You just seem like you have everything together. And looking at your office, 
I see hope for myself. And I'm so grateful that, 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 you know, that my mess in that context provided a space or a pathway of hope. Um, mm-hmm. So as, you know, again, as I hear you talking about kind of this reconciliation of spaces, um, that's, that's one type of negotiation that I would offer. But, you know, um, this is not a surprise for folks who have uh, either been to or lived in Oregon. You know, as I was raising a brown South Asian child in Corvallis, Oregon, where the best places I've ever lived, um, that I was like, she doesn't see herself. You know, there are not the, the cultural experiences, the language, you know. And so in my own negotiation and exploration at next level, it wasn't about the position or the position type. It was um, how can I center what my family needs while doing the work that I want to do? And that's that was actually the reason that I ended up from a large public institution to a small liberal arts school. And so it's so funny because I think what people want me to do is tell the story about, oh, the fidelity of small liberal arts and the meaning. And I, and I believe all of those things, but I also, I, I guess I am committed to being an educator and a facilitator of meaningful experiences that transform students' lives and that we do that in partnership with students. I think that that happens in many types of environments. And so if I can be you know, a partner alongside, you know, faculty, staff, and students and alumni and doing that where, and the community, wherever that is, I'm okay with that because that's not my, my center. It has never been fidelity to institution type, but I do feel like that's a narrative that we spin, right? Oh, you must have this arc of this institution type or this type of position, but th- that has never been my core. And and you kind of see that kind of in, in, in the well, transitions. And other people see your path. Yeah. <laughs> Mm-hmm. And they create a story, right? Right. And and you even create a story about your path <laughs> in retrospect, right? Yeah, absolutely. Where um, it, it all aligns. And, and I just think, you know, had I gone somewhere else after my doctorate, my whole life would be different. Mm-hmm. If I had gone to a different undergrad, my whole life would be different. I can't, in unimaginable ways, I have no idea. And so each of these paths, and you're just reinforcing to not just think about the job, the career, the title, the role, the institution, but the life whether that's family or location, who you want to be around or community or friends or climate or region of the country or access to healthcare, so many things um, to factor in and consider. Well, the, you know, in the previous episode, we talked about this transition from new to mid-career, right? Which is a, in, in our profession where the most people are and the, mm-hmm. the biggest transition and one that is super salient for so many people and, and this episode is kind of the home for the misfit toys, right? We're going to talk about everything else. Um, as, as you mentioned, terminal degree, moving into senior roles, which we've talked about, practitioner, faculty, faculty, back to practitioner, as I'm seeing happen a little bit more. Um, student affairs adjacent, which is, uh, or beyond student affairs, a, a transition that, that I've made. Uh, retirement, and, and I, uh, the, in the last episode, folks talked about um, really, you as editors trying to bring in people who had been through these transitions, not people who are theorizing or expecting or anticipated, but people who had, who had been through that. Um, so Dana, what, what would you add about some of these different uh, career transitions and maybe some of the ones that I'm missing? Yeah, I would say definitely in thinking, um, because one of my co-authors on the transition to a terminal degree was Marilee Dunn, and we both, even though we were both at different stages, we both had you know, that decision choice to think about when, you know what, what should I look at when I'm going for a doctorate? Is there a difference between EDD versus PhD? And in terms, a lot of people think is a PhD more prestigious? And I'm thinking it's all knowledge. And one of, I always cite um, uh, Leslie Gonzalez um, at Michigan State University. She went to University of Texas, El Paso. And she had talked about, you know, her transition when people would come up and say that. And I'm like, she's one of the most prolific scholars I've ever met. Mm-hmm. And she writes about knowledge production. So I'm like, it depends on what you want to do. And really connecting with faculty in those programs, whether it's an MBA, or if it's, you know, a legal degree, if you want to go for an EDD, if you want to build on certificates, like, it, it depends on, you know, what do you see as your purpose? And then you may not have an ultimate career goal in mind and it, mine changed. I thought I wanted to be a vice president of student affairs. Um, and at that point, I just, I was finding my energy in the classroom. And I was like, and that was one thing I had to ask to like, where do I get my energy from? Even though it challenges me, but where am I drawing that source of strength? And then from, for transition to 
faculty, um, one of the prior editors, Tony Cawthon, I went to him one day, I said, Tony, I think I want to be faculty. He's like, I love it. I said, what is different? I had to, I was curious about what is the difference in the search process mm -hmm. and what do you need to do? And um, he was telling me about that in terms of having a research agenda and looking at what is my teaching philosophy. So, and he said, it can be different things. And he said, the big thing is teaching experience. So I started unofficially kind of doing some adjuncting or teaching assistant work for him and Pam Havis so I could get the sense of what it took to prepare and what what that life would um, be like a little bit. Though getting into it was very different. Unlike sometimes student affairs, depending on where you're at, there's a lot of people to meet. There's a lot of either trainings that you need to go through. When you went to faculty, it was, it was like, here's our orientation. Here's what you need to do. Here's your office. And then go forth and you would have faculty meetings um, at different times, um, but usually maybe twice or once a month. So I had to get used to structuring myself, which I was happy the administrative role kind of taught me how to structure myself. So it's really thinking about how do you want to contribute and do you want to contribute in different ways? And I think even now I'm seeing some of my um, for I had taught in the master's program and I was looking at students, I, some of them are, were thinking, I like the traditional either res lines or student activities, but I'm really intrigued by going to like maybe an anthology or doing some student affairs adjacent work. And I said, you're still doing work. It just may not be on a college campus, but you're still doing work for student affairs. You're still contributing to the profession because I think they have a set mindset. Well, I need to work here for two to three years, but I've had um, a lot of colleagues or friends, whether mid-career or others, say, you know what, I wanna make a shift mm -hmm. and I wanna look at this. And I think it's added more to the conversation piece as well. And when we were thinking about, keep on thinking, I'm not near retirement, but when I was reading that chapter, I'm like, oh, these are things to think about in terms of, you know, how are you going to kind of transition out? Like, is it, you know, do you want to stop and then take, you know, some time to do some teaching before you formally retire? Do you want to take another role? Um, so it was, I mean, it's just interesting, all of those considerations um, to think about. So I guess my advice would be to always think of yourself in the journey. And I also said, think of where you are now, because there's one quote, I live by, I'm like, I've started, I, I thought I had to plan and hurt, hit certain mile markers, but I'm like, enjoy the journey mm -hmm. and enjoy the unexpectedness of what comes up or what opportunities present themselves. Um, Sanja Arden um, also said, there's one quote she has, and I said this, I have started saying it is never say never. If somebody asked me, would you be interested in academic administration? I said, I'd want to know what it entails, but <laughs> I'm not going to say never it just may not be at this moment but right. really just embracing that and embracing yeah. where you find the joy well this came up i mean tony mentioned it when we we're talking about uh new to mid-career transitions about enjoying the journey right mm -hmm. and this notion that which i attribute to george who may or may not be accurate but um serendipity is too important to be left to chance right yeah. how do you and, and what i'm hearing from you dina is when you are clear about your purpose, mm -hmm. then a lot of these choices kind of get aligned and clarified. When you're clear about, I want to teach. Okay, well, that means some things and some other things and kind of narrows this. I'm clear I want to be of service and, and, and work with students to better the student experience. Well, that clear, if that's your purpose, that clarifies a lot of things. Um, but then also being open and ready for the unexpected and ready to engage with it. Mamta, what would you add? Well, you know, as as I hear both of y'all talking, I, I'm chuckling because um, my career dream, which I, <laughs> I have yet to uh, like yet to kind of enter this world is I've always wanted to be um, a cabinet level um, diversity officer. <laughs> and that's the one job like and, and even before all of this, like in my in my early career, all of my dream was to be a director of a multicultural center. It's the one, <laughs> it's the one job I still don't have, you know, I've not had. And so, you know, um, but what I really appreciate, and so yes, this clarity of purpose mm -hmm. um, and how we are present in, and at least in our profession, fully present 
you know, in the academic mission and, and the joy and, um, you know, facilitations of students' hopes and dreams as they're pursuing their best lives. I think, you know, that, that, that has been my anchor. Again, it's easier for it to be my anchor right now, you know, with, with the, the class privilege that I hold. And I'm just going to keep repeating that because I don't, you know, my mother didn't have a chance to explore her purpose, right. And in, in, <laughs> um, in her life in the way that, you know, she, um, with, with her job and career choices. So, um, so, uh, but I also remember at a time when I thought, um, because I think another thing with career transitions is, are you bound by geography, right? Keith, mm-hmm. I think you mentioned briefly, like that could be a, a thing. There was a point in time, um, it, you know, I'm from Texas. I was, I'm in Austin, Texas right now. And I thought that my life and career would be at the university of, or in Austin, Texas, that I didn't have the flexibility to move at the time. And I had grown out, I'd really outgrown my position. And, you know, there were very many opportunities. So I was exploring all of these different things. Um, I will own that because of the class status by which I grew up in, I don't, and today, even now, I will tell you all, I still live with that mindset. So I'm not mm-hmm. entrepreneurial. I don't take those, like, I'm like, I want stability. I want, I want the mm-hmm. insurance. But like, those are mm-hmm. things that I think about because I remember my childhood, right? Mm-hmm. But what I will also say is when I started saying, you know, like, okay, like I, I didn't have the mentorship to think about what would it be to transition into a faculty journey because I didn't have the mentorship and nor did I know how to cultivate that mentorship. And so I was like, oh, I'm going to apply for postdocs and then I'm not going to get the postdocs. But then what I will do is I will use that as an opportunity to call the, the, call the, the faculty member and say, can you give me feedback on what I did and didn't have? And that's how I would improve. So I kid you not, postdoc interview, I get an invitation to an interview at the University of Houston. It was in women's studies. This is how I got the postdoc in women's studies at the University of Houston. I'm sitting in front of Elizabeth Gregory, and it's important for me to name her. She changed my life, right? And I'm sitting here telling her all the things I don't know how to do, mm-hmm. things you shouldn't do in an interview. But, um, and, and I was like, I've never done this before. I don't know, like, I don't even know why I'm sitting here in front of you right now. And she, she like, it was a matter of fact tone. She just, she, she looked up from her glasses and she was like, well, we all start somewhere, you know? And that one simple sentence, we all start somewhere and having that opportunity to do a postdoc in women's studies changed the trajectory of my life and my soul, right? I mean, it wasn't just a position. It was absolutely, we all start somewhere. Um, the, the other thing that I'll add, and I love this conversation about student affairs adjacent, again, much like I don't have fidelity to institution type, I, I mean, maybe you're going to kick me off the island now, but I also don't have fidelity to the term student affairs. I think we need educators like us in every field that will take us. So I'm going to, I'm going to name Mary Gonzalez right now, right? Mary Gonzalez, student affairs, um, uh, well, she was an undergrad student at the University of Texas, but student affairs professional, at, you know, at, at Southwestern um, in, you know, in Georgetown, Texas, but went on to become, right, represent El Paso in the Texas State Legislature. Le- T- Texas State Legislature. Who do you think is talking about critical race theory in the Texas State Legislatures are debating? I want educators like that in all dimensions of where we can be to transform the human experience and um, I, so I think that that's deeply exciting. Um, and, and if not for people like her, you know, who are organizing the LGBT caucus in the Texas state legislature, things like that, like we just, we need us and our spirits mm-hmm. in any space that is possible. So, so that's what I would advocate for. Well, Monta, you're in this role and, um, your second second and a half, maybe depending on how you count as an SSAO. <laughs> um, and so many folks I hear, uh, particularly new professionals and some mid-career professionals say, you know, when I'm finally the vice president, when I'm finally, uh, the, when I get to make all the decisions, when I get to do what I wanna do, and they have this image sometimes of the vice president, sometimes of the director as being able to do whatever they want. And a good colleague of mine reminds me, we're all middle managers. We all have a boss. We even the chancellor has a board and board of governors. Um, so, could you just talk a little bit about uh, the middle manager aspect of having this senior role? Yeah, absolutely. And so, I um, yes, we are all in the middle. Every single one of us is in some middle place, someplace. Um, and so, I think the reconcile. I keep using the word reconciliation because maybe that's the universe wants me to hear it for myself. But I. Um, I actually find that as my career has progressed, I actually make less decisions. 
Um, mm -hmm. Not that I have the right to make less decisions. I'm, you know, that I actually make less decisions because I feel like my job is to be an alchemist. I feel like my job is to shift energy um, mm -hmm. and um, not um, shift things, um, so to speak. And so, um, and here's where I chuckle and I, Dean, I would love to hear what you think about this as well. I find that like the skill set that I had as a dean of students, and even the skill set that I had as a you know in working in multicultural affairs before that, I feel like at, at every shift in position type, it's like I feel like I've had to do a one eighty of the skill. Like as a dean of students, I was a doer. I was I was rewarded rewarded for being a doer. I was recognized for do, doing the things. And uh, when I in my first VP role at Rollins. Um, doing things only has you carrying the heaviness, right? And when you and have, doing more things and, and doing more things, things. and then yeah. you're and you're reduced to the things and not the collective energy. And what I loved, um, you know, the seven year journey at Rollins, our team, we shifted the energy of the institution and we did it together. And so because we co created our mission together, and so I find that that I actually make and I make less decisions. And when I do make decisions, like I, that means like, like, like my own thought process is that, that like, this is a higher stakes thing coming from someplace beyond me. And then I try to be as um, I always say translucent because sometimes you can't share everything that you may want to share, mm -hmm. but, but I try to be as vulnerable about, you know, the why behind certain things. And, and but that also means receiving the, the critique Mm -hmm. um, for, for those complicated things. Right. And so I, I think that's what people don't understand is that in this role, the, um, you need to be okay with receiving the critique, re receiving the critique and most times not being able to fix it and just mm -hmm. sitting with the critique. Right. Well, you reminded me, uh, Barack Obama used to say he only makes the decisions that nobody else can make. Cause if it's, unless it's 51, 49, that those are the decisions he makes the 60, 40, he doesn't even get to his desk. Like some of that's already made before him. And so when you're the leader, you're really making the difficult decisions that others have really, um, brought to you and advised you. And yeah. then, and then you get the criticism that comes along with that. Right. And sometimes you get the criticism that comes along with someone else's decision and right. leading mm -hmm. in that way means being willing to weather that. Can I add one more thing? Mm -hmm. The one thing, and, and I would say this because this is um, the Mumta who worked, like if, 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 you were, if you had the ability to time travel and the 20 year old me was also on this panel, um, she would entirely critique everything that I'm saying right now. Uh, I'm not saying this from a good, bad, I'm not advocating, like this is just how I feel. So, mm -hmm. so I, I would also say the most significant part of my role is being in a relationship with people. And I say that all the time. I say that as somebody who's off the rails introvert. I say that as somebody who experiences microaggressions all the time. Mm -hmm. I cannot name the microaggressions all the time because if if I'm, and, and I want to, mm -hmm. and, and I have every right to, but if I am not at the table, the student experience is not at the table. Yeah. And so I weigh that a lot. And that means that's the toll part, right? So. Yeah. Uh, you know, I'll, like, you know, I'll, I'll give the example of like, I, re, you know, I, how many president's receptions have I sat um, in at, at the president's house? I, you know, I was sharing with my colleagues that there've been times where folks have handed me their trash mm -hmm. to throw away. Like, and I'm like, I'm wearing the suit and the name tag, like, like I'll be other VPs in the room. Mm -hmm. And do I confront that? I can't confront that moment or I choose not to because there is a greater good. Um, yeah. Somebody else might do something differently and that's fine. But these are the negotiations I think we have to think about. Yeah. Well, and I, I'm so glad you think that the 20 year old version of you would get on the podcast. <laughs> I promise you the 25 year old version of me, we would not let him on the podcast. It'd yeah. Be a terrible, terrible thing. Um, I want to, we want to get this um, two more questions. One is uh, it's July as we're having this conversation, releasing this and people are starting new roles, new role in mid role, new SSAO, some people just got the keys to their faculty office, Tina, yes. <laughs> wondering where the orientation is and it's not going to happen. And, um, yeah. All of these new things. What suggestions would you have folks as they're starting new roles, new institution, new paths? What would you want to remind folks as they're in these new beginnings? One thing I wanted to remind um, individuals um, to do, and this was something that was helpful for me when I first got on campus was 
I was really just trying to explore the campus culture. And I would ask even individuals as faculty, like who should I get to know, whether it would be faculty or others. And taking, um, it was reminding of, of something mom just said, like how do I be in relationship with others? And there's times when I would look at, and I know um, this is coming from the context where, I mean, when you mentioned state systems and boards and everything, um, this is the first time I've, um, every place I've had has had a system, but the University of System of Georgia and then the governor, and then we have regional institutions and you've got your faculty senate, it's knowing what roles individuals played and how could you, how could you mobilize um, different coalitions? Because I think that's something, or how do you start thinking about what your ideas are? How do you get to know the campus culture? What are some of the issues and some of the the ways I found out was by having conversations with other people, but also being attuned to what the student experience was. Um, and sometimes one of the things I used to do when I asked individuals what the issues were, and this goes back to something you mentioned, Keith, when they would say, oh, we're fine, I would always ask, do you have a copy of your student newspaper? Because I could generally get a sense of, I'm like, these are what the students are saying. Um, so I would say being attentive to that. And then also I would say too now, and I'm reminded by something I had uh, Dr. Melissa Shivers um, come yes. to my class, um, really talking about like where she was at with the transition and integrity and different career roles. And one of the things she mentioned is don't neglect that there's things happening behind the scenes, mm -hmm. um, but also just keep thinking about post COVID what are we going to be like when, well, not that we're completely post-COVID, I don't want to say that, but um, a lot of universities may be stating fall operations, we're going back to where we were, but we've had a whole year and a half of either being on Zoom, being disconnected from family, um, and like community, I mean, or other, the community is on Zoom, so, and there has been a wave of grief, a grief of experiences that didn't happen, grief and losing family members, so, thinking about that's been something on my mind is how do we operate from an ethic of care um, and an ethic of concern as we're coming back uh, or I know at least our institution has said yes we're opening on August 11th and it's um, I saw my colleague the other day he said this is the first time I've been in the office in a year and a half so a lot of us are reorienting ourselves so when I think about July coming back you're in adjusting to a new culture but you're also kind of adjusting to where are all of we at, not only physically, but where are we at in the space and how we are emotionally and personally as well. And that needs to be attended to. Well, and some people started a year ago and they've barely even been on campus. campus. So they're coming yes. back brand new, right, Mom? Just, so what advice yes. would you have for folks who are who are starting new roles, new institutions, or maybe, maybe in year two of being new? Yeah, yeah. So I, I keep telling everyone I get my I keep saying when I start my second first year in, in right. August um, and so I'm really thankful for that really thankful to have built relationships and, and now get to, to kind of uh, have a second first year truly um, I'm going to offer you know uh, Dita was so thoughtful you know with with all the you know the understanding of the emotional and spiritual landscape um, which I, that's the most important thing and I'm going to kind of um, add a corollary of some ticky tack things I mean some things that I wish um, we as educators would do a better job of, and whether we're seasoned or new, is read the fact book, know your, know your campus population. Um, um, absolutely, I don't know how to underscore the read the student newspaper. It may or may not be news, but it's what student th students are thinking, and that's important, right? And so it's, it's, it's their truth, and that's important. Um, if there are faculty governance minutes you know, that are accessible, that you have, mm -hmm. like, understand the complexities, like if they're uh, of the environment, if there are, tr you know, open trustees meetings, and you have access to those presentations, either behind your institution's credentials or not, um, participate in those experiences. Like, uh, I, you know, I do presentations for trustee student life, you know, um, and that's an open meeting for our institution. So I think, Mike, I would encourage, I wouldn't require anybody, but I would say that's a way to kind of understand um, the middle spaces that we all occupy. Mm -hmm. um, and then the, the other thing, and I think my intention here, sometimes I can sound harsher than I mean. And so I want to, uh, I'll preface by saying that first. We, our institutions are not responsible for our personal healing. 
Mm -hmm. Um, And I know that that becomes hard for us because we are the healers oftentimes Mm -hmm. for our student communities. Uh, All the complicated grief components that Dina talked about are real and they're real for us too. And it's not, uh, you know, it's the pandemic, it's the economic impact of the pandemic. So the economic losses for people who lost jobs, it is the the mass racial violence and the political Mm -hmm. unsteadiness and not just domestically, globally, right? Um, And so um, to understand that complicated grief and the the identities that we occupy and so how those, those grief moments also impacted us we have to create space for ourselves with our spiritual providers, with our therapists mm-hmm. to process that. And again, you know, institutions may provide, you know, and they may or may not be what we want them to be, but we have a duty of care to take responsibility of that. We need to student affairs ourselves is, is I guess how I would frame that. Then again, I just, I say that because I'm notorious for not doing those things. I'm also notorious for not taking care of my physical health, right? And so if it, like, so the same thing that I would say is like, we need to look at those, right? The Sam said with the, the, the eight domains of wellness, like how are we assessing those for ourselves so that we can be who we want to be as, as humans? Um, so, I mean, I think those are the, the spaces of reflection. I think, I, I actually think the next decade of our profession is fundamentally transformed. I have a middle school kid the, the, who's the, the, the pandemic, right, is now a moment. It is her moment in her life. And, and for so, and she's very privileged. But I think about what sixth grader who lost a family member or whose family member, like, who, or, or somebody lost a job, that now has impacted their economic reality for the next six or seven years until they go to college, if they choose to go to college or have access to college. And so, we need to let go of the nostalgia of why we went, we entered into the profession and we need to be present for students today and for the next decade, what they need based on the, the complicated trauma and that they have experienced. And so uh, I'm pulling from the Judd Foundation, right? Judd released this amazing report in August, uh, you know, August, 2020 around making sure that we understanding help seeking behaviors, understanding that students may not know how to seek support. And so things Mm -hmm. that we're going to think are basic are not Mm -hmm. basic. Mm -hmm. Um, And so we need to understand and honor their truth, not our nostalgia for why we entered the profession. Yes. Well, before we get to you, Dina, I got I will agree with you, Dr. Akapati, you are notorious. I will disagree that those are the reasons why you are notorious, (laughs) but we all have our own self-reflection and meaning meeting. Mm -hmm. Um, Dina, I want to jump to our last question, but go ahead and jump in and then we'll, we'll go to our wrap up question. Yeah. And yes, I just wanted to add on to what uh, Mamta had said as well, because I know even in working with students in our graduate school program, uh, one of them had gone through a lot of losing a family member, now having a family member who is facing a terminal illness. Mm -hmm. And one question they asked is, you know, I feel guilty going to counseling services because I don't want to take away from an undergraduate student, but I said, those services are there for you too. Mm -hmm. So, and I even share my own experience of having to use counseling services. So how can we, you're right. um, You're absolutely right. Like not only it's not just enough to say that they're there, but how do we teach individuals to access those services and knowing that they can access Mm -hmm. those services. Well, in two future episodes that will be coming up soon, we're going to talk about side hustles and student affairs side hustles. And so some of these transitions, things that folks are doing, and also have a whole episode dedicated to what we were just talking about, about what are workplace norms and how do we tend to the humanity of people as we hopefully don't go back to normal because normal Mm -hmm. wasn't great, but how do we move forward? How do we create something better going back, taking the best of what has been and the best of what was and and move forward with that. So those are some conversations we're coming up on. This is uh, Student Affairs Now. We're just about out of time. So we wanna hear what you're thinking now is on your mind with this conversation or just in general. And then we'd also love for you to share for folks who wanna connect with you in other ways, what's the best way for folks to reach out to you? Dina, how about you? What is on your mind now? What are you troubling, pondering, thinking about now? One of the things I keep thinking about too is in terms of my role with graduate preparation and doctoral programs is how does how does the standard curriculum need to change? Um, or how do we need to incorporate for what we're seeing? Because the I just have this sense that I know the field is going to be different. So how are we creating sustainable? This is the title of, I get, uh, 
Dr. Margaret Salih's book, um, Making Making Sustainable Careers in Student Affairs. Mm -hmm. Like, how do we create a trajectory in thinking about transitions? What is sustainable? And you're right, um, Keith, you mentioned this too. How can we start kind of troubling some of those norms we always had after working a year and a half in the it, working remotely or having more flexible arrangements? How does that honor um, everybody's sense of well being? So that's something that is just I'm thinking about right now. Um, I also wonder I know there have been statistics and articles in terms of attrition from the field. Um, I don't know what those statistics are now or if NASPA or ACP, I think um, some may be looking at that, is we're starting to see like where, how do, I, this goes back to sustainable careers is how do we talk about the trajectory and how do we trouble some of our, our norms like this whole, you know, I got to work 80 hours a week. It's like, not really. Um, so how do we start thinking about um, some of those items that we can look at? in terms of career development. Great, thank you. Mopta, what are you uh, tr thinking, troubling, or pondering now? Well, I'm, I'm pondering how lucky I am to be in a community of educators that are likely the ones listening to this podcast and, and to be alongside all of you, because if ever a time, if ever a time, I know I'm sounding very cliche here, if ever a time for mm -hmm. educators like us, now is more than ever that time. And so the, the reflection that I have is that um, there, there are things we learn. And so I'm, I'm, it's so tough to go after Dina, you know, the, the, um, you know because the, all the, it, your, your wisdom around the grad prep programs, and it's just so heartwarming to hear you think about that and say, okay, yes, these things have to be different. Um, and I would also say, as we're participating in those experiences, remember, there's only one of each and every one of us, right? So mm -hmm. we bring a set of wisdom and lived experiences that connect with the knowledge to make it what it is. So when we enter our institutions, only we have the wisdom we bring to the table and that wisdom mm -hmm. is necessary right now. And anytime we show up in the fullness of our wisdom, there, there is a student, there is a faculty member, there's an alum, somebody who is being moved by that. And just because you mm -hmm. don't hear it doesn't mean it's not happening. So mm -hmm. just don't underestimate the energy that, that you all bring um, to, to our, our, our educational communities. Wonderful. Yes. And how can people connect with you, Mamta? Uh, yes. So um, while I do use Twitter, email, and LinkedIn, probably LinkedIn is the best way um, yes. to connect. And I would I would love um, to learn from anybody and, and connect with anybody who wants. Well, and you do, not only are you there, you're doing lots of sharing of wonderful heart yes. pieces and thought pieces there oh, as well. Thanks. So I recommend that. And, and how about you, Dina? How can people connect with you? Um, the best way, I'm usually on Twitter and I'm also on LinkedIn is too. And I think um, it's part of the podcast. So I try and share out or do some retweets, yes. but if there's something to comment on or even um, articles for another role, those are the best two places to reach me. Wonderful. Well, thanks to you both so much. So, so grateful for your time and your wisdom and your insight uh, to the book and now sharing this with our audience. Thanks so much, so much to each of you as our guests grateful for your time today on Student Affairs Now. And thanks to our sponsor on this special bonus episode from Colorado State Online. Colorado State University Online is now offering a fully online Master of Science in Student Affairs. This program will help you gain the professional competencies, knowledge, and experience to succeed as a higher education administrator. You will earn the same master's degree and learn from the same faculty as CSU's on-campus students. Learn more at online.colostate.com. Edu. Huge shout out to Natalie Ambrosi, the production assistant for the podcast, who does all the behind the scenes work and will make us sound and look good. If you're listening today and not already receiving our weekly newsletter, please visit our website at studentaffairsnow.com and scroll to the bottom of the homepage to add your email to our MailChimp list. While you're there, check out our archives, all wonderfully organized by NASPA and ACPA professional competencies. I'm your host, Keith Edwards. Thanks again to our fabulous guests today. And for everyone who is watching and listening, please make it a great week. Thanks all. Mm -hmm.